Our Island Story, Chapter 90. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 90. George I. The Story of the Earl of Mar's Hunting Party. Queen Anne was the last of the Stuarts, and her husband and all her children died before she did. She had no near relatives, except her brother, who was called the Pretender. He was a Roman Catholic, and therefore could not succeed to the throne, for in the time of William and Mary a law had been made that no Roman Catholic should ever again wear the crown. The people had foreseen that after Queen Anne died there might be quarrels as to who should reign next, so that too had been settled by law in the time of William and Mary. James I of England had a daughter called Elizabeth, who married the King of Bohemia, and her grandson, George, Elector or King of Hanover, was the nearest Protestant heir to the throne. He was the great-grandson of James the Sixth. So, as soon as Queen Anne died, George was proclaimed king in England, Scotland, and Ireland, without any fighting or quarrelling. But although his grandmother had been British, George himself was as German as could be, and he could not even speak a word of English. He was fifty-five years old when he came to the throne, and was too old ever to learn the English language, or English ways and manners. The Jacobites had never lost hope of having once more a Stuart king. Now they felt was the time to try. The new king was a German, and the people, they thought, would surely rather have a man of their own country than an old German to reign over them. The Earl of Mar, making believe that he was going to have a great hunting party, asked a number of the Highland lords to his house. They came but soon it was seen that it was not deer they meant to hunt, and a large army gathered round Lord Mar and the standard of James the Eighth, which was the title the Pretender took. In their caps they wore his badge of wacade, or rosette. The Pretender's standard was of blue silk, having on one side the arms of Scotland worked in gold, and on the other side the Scottish thistle, with the motto, Nemo me empun lasset, which means, those who touch me will suffer for it. It also had two streamers of white ribbon, on one of which were the words, For our wronged king and oppressed country, and on the other, For our lives and liberties. There was great rejoicing when the standard was unfurled, but scarcely had it been done when the golden ball fell from the top of the staff. This made the Highlanders very sad, for they were superstitious, and thought it meant bad luck. But when our standard was set up, so fierce the wind did blow, Willie. The golden knop down from the top, and to the ground did far, Willie. Then second-sighted Sandy said, Well, din a good at our, Willie. While pipers play frae right to left, fi furrock wigs away, Willie. In the north of England, Lord Derwentwater and another gentleman gathered an army of Jacobites, and proclaimed James King. But neither Lord Mar nor Lord Derwentwater were good generals. Having got their soldiers together, they did not seem to know what to do with them. So when King George's army met Lord Derwentwater's army, the Jacobites yielded almost without a struggle. In Scotland the Jacobites under Lord Mar, and the King's soldiers under the Duke of Argyle, met at a place called Sheriff Muir, near Dunblane. Lord Mar called a council of war, and asked his captains, Shall we fight, or shall we go back? And all the captains called out, Fight! Fight! Lord Mar agreed, and they all went to their places. No sooner did the Highlanders know they were to fight, than a great cheer went through the army, every man tossing his cap in the air. Every Scotchman there was glad at the opportunity of fighting his old enemies, the English. With broadswords drawn, colours flying, and bagpipes playing, they rushed to battle. But brave and fierce though the Highlanders were, they lacked a clever leader, 
so it happened that one half of Mars' soldiers beat one half of Argyle's, but the other half of Argyle's beat the other half of Mars, so each side claimed the victory. There's some say that we won, some say that we won, some say that none won at our man. But one thing I'm sure that at Sheriff Muir, a battle there was which I saw, man. And we ran, and they ran, and they ran, and we ran, and we ran, and they ran away, man. If we have not gained a victory, said one Jacobite general, we ought to fight our guile once a week until we make it one. But Ma did nothing, and James, who had promised to come from France, did not arrive. So disappointed and discontented, many of the chieftains and their followers went home again. But at last James landed. He was greeted with great joy, and rode into Dundee with three hundred gentlemen behind him. Now, thought the Jacobites, we have a king. Now we will be led to battle and victory. But they were again disappointed. James was no soldier. He was pale, grave, and quiet. He never smiled, and he hardly ever spoke. The men soon began to despise him, and to ask if he could fight or even speak. Day after day passed, and nothing happened. "'What did you call us to arms for?' asked their angry Highlanders. "'Was it to run away? What did the king come for? Was it to see his people butchered by hangmen, and not strike one blow for their lives? Let us die like men, and not like dogs!' If our king is willing to die like a king, there are ten thousand gentlemen who are not afraid to die with him. But it was of no use. Nothing was done. The pretender, taking the Earl of Mar with him, slunk back to France, a beaten man, for want of courage to strike a blow. And sad and angry, the Jacobite army melted away. Some of the leaders escaped to foreign lands, others were taken prisoner to the tower, and afterwards beheaded. Amongst those were Lord Derwentwater. This rebellion is known as the Fifteen, because it took place in 1715 A.D. O oh, far fra me hame, full soon will I be. It's far, far fra hame in a strange country, where I'll tarry a while, return, and with ye be. And bring many jolly boys to our own country. I wish you all success till I again ye see. May the lusty Highland lads fight on and ne'er flee. When the king sets foot aground and returns from the sea, then you'll welcome him home to his own country. God bless our royal king from danger, keep him free. When he conquers all the foes that oppose his majesty. God bless the Duke of Mar and all his cavalry, who first began the war for a king in our country. Let the traitor king make haste and out of England flee, with all his spurious race come far beyond the sea. Then we will crown our royal king with mirth and jollity, and end our days in peace in our own country. End of chapter 90